Father in heaven, uh, we come before you this morning, uh, and I can't help but all of, think about all of these songs we've just sung, about how good you are, how you pursue us. There's no need anymore for sacrifices, for blood from goats and bulls and sheep to cleanse us from our sin. And that, Jesus, it was your blood in your sacrifice that made a way for us to be right with God. That we can stand in the holy presence of the Almighty God without fear, without guilt, because of Jesus. There is such beauty in that. God, would you compel us towards that? God, even in our crowd this morning, there's several of us who are in need, some physically, uh, emotionally, maybe marriages, financially, jobs. Uh, God, probably all of us here have areas in our lives of great need. Uh, we lift those up to you. Uh, so many of these things are way beyond us and our uh, ability to change things or change people or change situations. But God, you are in complete control. So we lift these things to you, asking that you would demonstrate your power. Demonstrate again your love for your children. Give us the ability to trust you, that you've got this. And so we thank you. Thank you in advance for what you are doing, for what you are going to do, as we trust you. Now, God, as we go into your word, I pray that you would open our eyes so that we can see, open our minds that we can understand, um, and God, speak to us precisely where we are today. Maybe everybody in the room completely differently, but would you speak? Move us forward. Help us to see the beauty of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes difficult things are the road to something better. Do you know what I'm saying by that? Sometimes the difficult things that come up are, are the road to something better or something great. Uh, like tobogganing. I don't know how many times I tried to convince my kids that pulling the thing back up the hill is worth the ride down. Right? As a child, you don't understand that. Um, but, but we understand that you need to pull it back up the hill if you're going to have the fun of sliding down. And that, for me, was like uh, our reading plan in the last seven to ten days. This is the hardest part to dig through. How many of you are still reading? Okay, not as many as were a few weeks ago. Uh, if you've fallen behind, just jump back in. Don't try to catch up. But... Uh, this part here through the end of Exodus and the beginning of Leviticus and even the next, uh, maybe the next three or four weeks is probably, at least for me, it's the hardest part to read through. There's so much repetition. There's, it's, it's, it, it seems like it doesn't matter and it's dry. Um, we got the plans for the tabernacle and I think those plans are given five times. We've got the, the clothing for the priests and the plan for the sacred articles, the instructions for the Sabbath, how to build the Ark of the Covenant. And, and then we get into Leviticus and it starts listing all the offerings that they had. And then the priests were finally commissioned to do their work. And folks, if you're struggling reading through this, this is the hardest part. Stick with it. Um, I want to, if we don't do anything else today in the next half hour, I want to show you how it all fits. If we could back up and roll it all up into a ball and look at all of history, this part, as difficult as it is to get through, is so critical to history. And it matters in our lives for you and me. And I want to kind of get through some of that this morning. It also shows us a lot about the character of God. 
And we looked at all of these different offerings, the beginning of Leviticus here, the peace offering and the sin offering and the guilt offering and, and on and on. All of, the, um, all of the slaughtered animals, all of the blood. Why all the blood? Well, if we looked in Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, the law required, that's what we've been reading, all of these laws, the law required that everything had to be cleaned and purified by blood. And it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Folks, that has not changed. That has not changed. And, and um, when we look at it in that day, it was the blood of goats and bulls and sheep that, that were sacrificed as a substitute to cleanse people from their sin. And, and in a sense... The things that happened to these animals should have happened to people because of their sin. And the animal was a sacrifice. Well, if you've been tracking uh, in our reading, and a lot I'm going to talk about this morning is directly from what we've been reading. And so if you haven't been, um, I'll do my best to help you stay with it and understand. If you have, it's going to make perfect sense. Um, but as we've been tracking with these people, what I've seen more than anything else over the last few weeks is what God wants. God wants that you will be my people and I will be your God. We see that over and over and over. And all of these laws, all these sacrifices, all of these offerings, all of these rituals and all of this stuff is so that that could happen. And as we've been tracking with these people, here's something that's just been crazy to me. These, these people see the visible presence of the Almighty God every single day. Think about what they've, they've gone through. Every day, there's, there's, they're led by a pillar of cloud in the day, and, and it turns to a pillar of fire at night. God's presence is visible in that every single day. They get to... Um, the Red Sea or in Egypt and the 10 plagues. And they see the mighty power in these miracles of God. They get to the Red Sea and they're trapped between the Egyptians and the water and God holds up the Egyptians and opens the Red Sea and they have a way of escape. They experience that right full on in Exodus chapter 5 to 15. They get to Mount Sinai and, and as Moses goes up the mountain and God descends on the mountain and the earth shakes and there's smoke, and there's fire, and there's lightning, and the thunder, and a booming voice from God in Exodus chapter 19. They lived this. They experienced this. They saw that. And then Moses comes down from the mountain, and his head is glowing from the presence of God, that he had to put a veil over it so they'd stop staring. They lived this. They saw this. And then God provides fresh drinking water where there was none in Exodus 17. And then God provides bread and meat for them daily where there was none in Exodus chapter 16. And then the glory of God, which I, we can't even imagine. The glory of God comes down and fills the most holy place in the temple. It was like a cloud that came down and at night it was full of fire and rumbling in Exodus chapter 34. Can you even imagine the, the constant, visible presence of God right amongst them. You'd think that that would be enough to cause in them a holy reverence and a constant awareness. God was real and right there. You would think that that would change their attitudes and their behavior. It didn't. This, after... Uh, as I said, when, when Egyptians were chasing them and they're stuck between the Red Sea and the Egyptians and this cloud that, that was the presence of God leading them, that the cloud stopped and went around behind them, between them and the Egyptians and lowered down and caused the Egyptians to stop in their tracks and enter confusion, giving these people time 
to see what God was doing and where he was taking it. They lived this. They saw this. God was right there. You'd think that was enough for them to really know and trust him, right? How much unmistakable interaction with God do they need? God wants to be the center of their lives, the center of their culture, the center of their society, the center of their day-to-day experience. We sang one of the songs this morning that said, we've seen you move mountains, and we know you will do it again. Folks, they knew it and saw it every single day. They, They actually got up every morning and saw the pillar of cloud in front of them. It was the presence of God, and when the cloud moved, they packed up their tents and followed. Every single morning, they woke up and said, today, we're going to follow God. Do you see that? Visibly, physically, we're going to follow God as it moved ahead of them. He was their God. But it was a long way from what God, lo- what God longed for. Every time push came to shove, every time their faith was challenged, every time they didn't necessarily like what was happening, their trust evaporated, their, their giving God control vanished. And as you'll read next week, they were even sacrificing babies to the Canaan god Malak. Their tents had idols to other gods. No wonder God repeats himself over and over and over and over in these passages. They're in a constant state of up and down, of brokenness and trouble and sin. They're dedicated and then obedient, and then they fall apart and crash, and they're broken again, and they're self-centered in rebellion. So what God does is God gives them a system. God gives them a structure. God gives them a place where they can constantly fix that. God gives them the tabernacle. God gives them the place, the tabernacle, where where they can go and be made right with him. The tabernacle and all of this ritual and structure, uh, structure that went around it. The tabernacle itself was a consistent place where God was, where they can go and become right with him. The offerings and the sacrifices were the consistent way that they could be made clean again and be set right with God and seek forgiveness until they needed it again. It was probably the next day. Everybody, including the priests, were broken and sinful and inconsistent, and that's why we have a book like Leviticus. It's so that they could learn to live in purity. They, God set up a calendar with, with offerings and feasts in a structured order that, that there was consistent physical reminders of their need and what God has done and how to come back to him and how the priests will maintain it all. That's what we've been reading. The tabernacle, in the, in the tabernacle, uh, the tabernacle was, was a big tent with with ridiculous details on, on everything. But, but really it was set up with three sections. There was the larger section around the outside that was the outer court. This is where the people could come, where they could bring their offerings and their sacrifices. This is the section where the priests would offer those sacrifices on the altar. In that, there was a tent. And, and the first layer, the first room in that tent was called the holy place. Only priests could go in there. They went, went in every day. They, they lit um, the candles and they presented the offerings of bread and they had incense burning in there. This was the holy place. And then in that, there was a smaller room that was called the most holy place. We call it the Holy of Holies. And this is where God's presence was. The priests did not go in there. No one went in there. There was no access. The priests would go in one day a year on the Day of Atonement. And he would walk in there with two bowls of blood, 
one that he would present as an offering for his own sin and one that he would present as an offering for the people's sin. And he did this once a year. Every detail of what he did had to be done precisely. There was sprinkling of the blood in the right place, in the right order. There was detailed prayers, he would say. Um, even what he wore, there was ridiculous detail. And at some point, they, 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 they strung gold bells around the bottom of his robe. Because uh, if you went in there and did something wrong, or if you went in there at the wrong time, uh, it, it was immediate death. And so if they had bells around the bottom of his garment, the priests who were in the, in the outer tent could listen. And if the bells stopped for a prolonged period of, period of time, they knew that he was dead. So eventually in history, when the high priest went in there one day a year, they would tie a rope around his ankle. And the other end would be outside so that if the bells stopped and they assumed he was dead, they could pull him in because no one could go in there or else they'd die too. So here's what I want to say about that. Between the holy place and the most holy place was this massive curtain or veil. And that is a critical thing in all of history. It separated the holy place where the priests could go and the most holy place where God's presence was, where he could only go once a year. Um, God was behind that curtain. And you had no access to God. So all of this ceremony, all of this ritual, over and over and over, and day after day after day, was simply to establish, to constantly remind, to teach them and point out that we are sinful. We are broken, we mess up, we constantly fall short of God's perfection. It was there to point them to, so they understand that correcting that is available. It was temporary, but it was available and necessary, and it showed them that they cannot do it. There is nothing we as humans can do that could correct anything so that we could be right with God doesn't matter how great we are. We will fall short. And it, we needed a mediator. It was a visual reminder and a high cost to their pocketbooks all the time. That what happened to these animals should be happening to me, that they were a substitute. Okay. If you've been with us in our reading plan, then uh, this all makes sense to you. This is just a summary. And I hope, uh, if you haven't been, this gives you a little bit of cultural understanding. This is all from the end of the book of Exodus, the beginning of the book of Leviticus. So let's fast forward now, 1,500 years. 1,500 years after this, Jesus was on the earth. And if you have a Bible, go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 is the end of Jesus' life, and he is um, arrested. He's been mocked and tried, sentenced to death, and he is on the cross. And in Matthew chapter 27, we'll come to that in a second. What happens when Jesus dies? As we look through the whole New Testament, see, back in the days of Exodus and Leviticus, they had no idea about this. Uh, in, in the day of Jesus, they understood the Leviticus law and the sacrifices very, very well. And they didn't understand the Jesus bit. We have the opportunity to look back from thousands of years later and see it all in history unfold. What happens when Jesus died? Jesus' death accomplishes a number of things. It accomplishes peace with God. That's what the tabernacle was all about, to establish peace with God. It, the death of Jesus uh, accomplished redemption and forgiveness for sin. That's what the temple and the sacrifices were all about. Jesus' death was a ransom. It was a price paid as a substitute. And that word ransom is a phrase that comes right from those days. The 
blood of the goats and the bulls and the sheep were ransomed to buy their freedom. Jesus was that too. And Jesus' death accomplished atonement, which is the price is paid to buy freedom. But the word atonement is beautiful in its understanding if we want to make it oversimplified. Atonement simply means at one meant. So I want to be at one with God. It requires atonement. At one meant. And that was the whole point of the tabernacle and all of that ritual. I want you to see that the reason for the tabernacle in the first place, the reason for all of these laws and all of this ritual, the reason for all of that is fulfilled and completed in Jesus, in Jesus on the cross. Now look at Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to read just a couple of verses, uh, starting in verse 50. And Jesus shouted out, he is on the cross here. He shouted out and released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split apart, the tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. And they left the cemetery after Christ's res uh, resurrection and went into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people. And the Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that happened. And they said, this man truly was the son of God. The crazy things that happened the moment Jesus died. Specifically, this curtain, this veil, the one that separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn in half from top to bottom. Not fixable, irre irre irreplaceable, imparably, uh, irreparably damaged. It can no longer perform the function. What was its function? To separate the presence of God from you. And it was ripped in half. It cannot look, can no longer do what it intended. It means there's no longer a physical barrier between me and you, between people and God and the presence of God. You see what God did? The Hebrew people would have been freaking out because access to God meant instant death. Look at what God was doing now that we have the whole story. God was allowing us to see his presence. God was allowing us access to his presence. God was allowing us to walk right into the most holy place, that place that the high priest could only go in once a year. God was allowing us to go right into the mercy seat, the place of his judgment and mercy. God was saying, you can walk right up to the place of atonement. This is a huge deal. Everything about their religious history was now out the window. It was all ripped apart. It was all changed. And as you're reading, reading through Leviticus, we have the privilege of knowing the end of the story. So listen to this summary. Written, written centuries later. Let me read this. I don't very often read a chunk on Sunday mornings. Let me read this. This is a summary of all of that written centuries later. That first plan, that we've been reading about in Exodus and Leviticus, uh, contained directions for worship, an especially designed place of worship. A large outer tent was set up with a lampstand, a table, the bread of the presence, and they were all placed in it. This was the holy place. Then a curtain was stretched, and behind it, a smaller tent set up. This was the most holy place, or the holy of holies. In it were placed the gold incense altar, and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant containing uh, a gold urn of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, the covenant tablets of the Ten Commandments, and angel-winged shadowed mercy seat. After this was set up, the priests went about their duties in the large tent. That's the holy place. 
The high priest entered the smaller inside tent, the most holy place, once a year, offering the blood sacrifice for his own sin and the, and the people's accumulated sin. This was the Holy Spirit's way of showing uh, with a visible parable that as long as the large tent stands, people can't just walk in on God. Here's the problem. Under this system, the gifts and sacrifices can't really get to the heart of the matter. They can't change the conscience of people. They're limited to matters of behavior. And it's, it's essentially a temporary arrangement until a complete overhaul could be made. But when the Messiah arrived, he, Jesus, bypassed the old system and its trappings and its ritual and went straight into heaven's tent, the true holy of holies, once for all time. He completely skipped the sacrifices of goats and calf blood. Instead, he used his own blood as the price to set us free from sin once for all, freeing us from all our dead-end efforts to make ourselves respectable so that we can live all out for God. By coming up with a new plan, a new covenant between God and his people, God put the old plan that we've been reading about on the shelf. And it stays there gathering dust. These animal sacrifices aren't needed anymore. Having served their purpose, for Christ didn't enter an earthly version of the holy place. He entered the place itself. And he offered himself to God as a sacrifice for our sins. He doesn't go into the most holy place every year like the priests did under the old plan with blood that was not their own. But instead, he sacrificed himself once for all, summing up all the other sacrifices in the sacrifice himself, the final solution of sin. Now, if you followed that, that's a, a pretty well-written summary of how the Leviticus and the temple and the laws and the offerings uh, all fit in context of history and how Jesus was the fulfillment of all of that. Do you know where that's from? It's not from somebody's sermon. It's from a book that was written to the Hebrew people centuries later the Hebrew people who were still in that sacrifice world, constant, repetitive ritual, and they did not believe that Jesus rose. Jesus was the Messiah, that he died and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven. They wouldn't believe it. And this book was written to connect the dots for them so that they could see that Jesus is the solution to all of that problem. And I know you know what it is already. It's in our Bibles. It's called the book of Hebrews. Now, in our reading, we won't get to Hebrews until next December. But I want you to see today that this was God's plan all along. If you go to Hebrews, this was a summary, a little snippets from chapters 5 through 10. And I want to read just one little section of that, just a couple of verses here from chapter 10. The old system under the law of Moses, was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, and they were never able to provide cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, then sacrifices would have been stopped. For the worshipers would have been purified once for all time and their guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sin, year after year. It's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That is why, when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you've given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings and other offerings of sin. And I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, and is written as it is written about me in the scriptures. And on that same page is what I looked at before in chapter 9, verse 22, 
In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything needs to be purified with blood. But without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. What does all of that tell us? What does all of that tell us? All of these laws, all of this ritual, all of this bloodshed, all of this detail, the priests and their work, even what they're wearing, and even the tabernacle itself was temporary. It was temporary. It was meant to point people to the need for a savior. God was setting the table for his permanent solution. At the point of Jesus' death, the tabernacle and then the temple and the sacrifices are no longer necessary. They only cleared somebody until the next time they sinned. And then they'd have to do it all again, maybe 10 minutes later. It's no longer necessary because Jesus, our high priest, offered his own blood for that atonement so that we can be at one with God. Jesus fulfills all the requirements of all of that ritual. And Jesus fulfills and ends all of the intentions of that Old Testament system. The second thing that this means to us is that we have complete access to the throne room of God. Complete access, unrestricted access. That veil, that curtain that was the separation, the physical barrier, when, when the access to God was strictly prohibited because of his holiness. His holiness hasn't changed just because the curtain got ripped. But he made a way for us to be holy too. And so, as Hebrews says, we have confidence to enter the most holy place of God's presence. We have an unprecedented, unequaled opportunity to draw close to God. What do we do with that? We have complete access into the very presence of God, the holies of holies, the, 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 the most holy place, every single day, it's all finished, and it's because of what Jesus had done. In chapter 10 of Hebrews, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain to the holy place. If you have this kind of access to God's most holy place, to his presence, do we take that seriously? Or are we flippant with that? Do we take it for granted? Are we too casual? Too complacent? Understanding what they had to go through week after week after week, just so they could worship. They took it seriously. It was so serious to the point of death. And I want us to see how beautiful this free gift of Jesus is, that we can access the throne room of God without fear. That, that Jesus actually said we can call God Abba, which is the most intimate Father. It's Daddy we can crawl up into God's lap and curl up with his arms around us without fear because of what Jesus has done. I don't know about you, but I want to go into his most holy place. I want to be his most holy place. What does God want out of all of this? It seems like a lot of ritual, a lot of blood, a lot of doing, a lot of everything. What does God want? I want to boil it down to one thing. What does God want? He wants us to be his people, that he would be our God. He wants you to be his, and he will be your Lord. He wants relationship. Surrender in the sense that, that we can completely trust him to be God. 
And as I said, these folks saw that day after day after day, this miraculous power and all of this. If anybody could trust God with their lives completely, it should have been them, but they blew it every single day. Sound familiar? Folks, I want to enter the Holy of Holies. That we would be his people and he would be our God. Let's pray together. God, take me into the Holy of Holies. Take me by the blood of the Lamb. Take me to the Holy of Holies. Take the coal and cleanse my lips. Here I am. Take me past the outer courts. Take me through the holy place, past the altar where the sacrifice happens. Lord, I want to see your face. Pass me by the crowds of people and the priests who are singing their praise. I hunger and thirst for your righteousness. And it's only found in one place. Thank you, Father, for what you have done. You have done everything necessary for us to know you, to be redeemed, purified, cleansed, We can stand in your presence even though perfection is required. We can stand there because Jesus was perfect and he gave us that. So we come into your throne room with confidence. God, my prayer for all of us this morning is that we would run there with vigor. And we are human and we know that and we will fail. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for pursuing us that the God Almighty wants to dwell inside of us and take us to his most holy place. In Jesus' name, amen.